the Eid Squail. It's so good to see so many members of our community here taking an active interest in how we can do our part locally to tackle this global problem. Right. Second while I get my notes up here. Okay. So we've got an exciting lineup of speakers who are generously volunteering their time today. Uh, and I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about myself uh, after I let you know what our lineup is looking like for this afternoon. Um, so we've got, uh, to begin with, uh, some drumming. We've got a poetry reading, and then we'll have a recorded message from Mayor Krogh offering a territory acknowledgement as well as some words of support. We're gonna hear a bit about community climate hubs across Canada, and we'll hear from some of our elected representatives at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels, as well as local youth involved in the climate movement, and local author and activist Guy Donsey. We'll also have a chance to learn a little about the Reimagine Nanaimo survey from city planner Rob Lawrence. And after we hear from our speakers, we're gonna split out into breakout rooms to share some ideas about how we can transition to a low emission city. And then we'll come back to the larger group for some questions and some discussion. And we're gonna close the meeting with another poem read by Nanaimo's Youth Poet Laureate. So just before we get to the speakers, I wanted to let you know a little bit about me. I got concerned about the climate emergency after hearing about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report in 2018. And so I joined up with Citizens Climate Lobby, which is an international organization that's focused on lobbying for federal level carbon fee and dividend policies. And then this summer, myself and a group of Citizens Climate Lobby members from across BC got together to form the BC Climate Alliance, which is now focused on lobbying the provincial government for stronger carbon pricing, elimination of fossil fuel subsidies, and better forest stewardship. So I think those are both great organizations, but I'm also seeing the need for changes at the municipal level, which does have jurisdiction over some important areas like transportation, building bylaws, waste management, and land use planning. And at the same time, working on changes in our own backyard seemed like a great way to bring more people into the climate movement. I heard about the Community Climate Hubs Initiative and I wanted to see if there would be interest in starting one in the demo. So here we are, and it sounds like there is, because there's lots of us here today. So my hope is that this event will be a jumping off point for a coordinated local effort to achieve the 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that scientists say we must achieve in the next 10 years to avert catastrophic consequences. There's an important opportunity to influence the direction of Nanaimo's emissions reduction strategy right now through the Reimagine Nanaimo public engagement questionnaires, which will be closing at the end of November. Please feel free, feel free to use the chat throughout this event to ask questions or share your thoughts. I'll ask that we do keep it respectful and constructive in the chat. Uh, and we may not be able to address all of the questions today, but we are gonna save the chat. And so that way we'll be able to capture all of the ideas shared. Um, and if you can just please use the raise your hand button on your Zoom menu if you have a question or comment, um, and we'll do our best to catch those when we get to the discussion time. Um, and just if you can also keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking, that will help to minimize any background noise. So uh, we packed a lot of great speakers into our agenda, and in order to keep things moving along, I'm going to um, kind of keep track of the time for each speaker and when a speaker has 30 seconds left I will hold up a sign and hopefully you'll be able to see me holding that up to say 30 seconds left and then I'll hold up another sign when your time is up. Um, generally we're kind of maxing out at five minutes per speaker uh, so then we can keep the event flowing. Okay so without any further ado um, and let's we'll just take a moment in case there's anything coming up in the chat in terms of any technical issues um, or problems that we need to look at before we actually launch into the program. Uh, we have a welcome from Gail Morton in New Chalnu Territory in Port Alberni. Great. Um, um, is Lawrence Larry, in terms of unmuting, I don't see a Lawrence to unmute, I just see a Larry. Uh, I think Hello? I saw, oh, hi, are you there? Yeah, that's not my English name on there. That's why you can't find me. Okay. Perfect. How do you pronounce uh, your First Nations name? Uh, um, Quatin. Some Quatin. 
Thank um, you. Clarkton. Yep. Great. Okay. So it uh, looks like everything is working all right for folks. So uh, perhaps then I can invite you, Tom Quatton, to start us off. Oh, the sleek one is yet to Ellie Nishwalakwa Tanahunant. Heitchka Slachen to Sars Tamach Nature and Ammo. E. C. Yatia Quam Quam Stoch Tan Shwalakwa Snanemoch Nestayu. Uh, I'd really like to thank each and every one of you for all of your import, important work and uh, blessing the sacred lands of the Snanimok people and wherever you reside. Uh, and to honor that um, work, I would like to share a song with you. Um, this song is a healing Mother Earth song, and the words are Kha Kha Sash Main. Uh, our sacred blessed father um ti wi ath san kus hustafi sleta kan se to um praying for the earth to be healed properly hai chuka oh Thank you for inviting me here tonight. It was a great honor and privilege to be amongst such beautiful people and a part of some sacred work. And I've called upon the ancestors to be with us and open up our hearts and minds and our spirits for the good work to take place. Uh, Thank you for that wonderful welcome. We're very pleased to have you here with us and grateful for you volunteering your time. So next up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sonnet Mabe, who is a professor at Vancouver Island University and a poet. Um, if you don't mind unmuting yourself there, please go ahead. Um, and prepare Sonnet. Um, and hi, 
Miwetsian. Uh, thank you, Heather, for inviting me to, to join you here and um, to those goals that you articulated about reducing emissions are, are concrete and um, great to focus on. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, come, come at this poem from uh, and speaking to you from the perspective that the changes to our physical climate and our environment so many of those changes are anthropogenic, meaning that they're they're human um, human caused. And my work, uh, I'm not a I'm not a scientist. I, I try to change make change at the level of the human heart and the level of of culture. And uh, for me, my own personal perspective, it's hard for me to see climate change outside of a long story of resource extraction and treating the land and the people and certain peoples in exploitative uh, ways naming some people civilized and other people wild or savage, and the connection of a feeling of supremacy over the land with a feeling of supremacy over certain people. Um, I feel as though um, being open to conversations about, um, about culture and, is, is, and conversations about race allow us to be more open and clearer about conversations um, in conversations about resources, land protection, um, changing how decisions are made, and even about decisions and uh, voices in our own organizations and, and um, yeah, representations in our own backyards, as you said. So part of my work as a scholar is I'm, I'm connected to the Association for Literature and Environment and Culture in Canada. It's our uh, Canadian Environmental Literature Association. They have a journal called The Goose, and I uh, published this poem in that environmental literary journal. Not rising tides, nor changing climate, nor soil pollutions vex me lately. This is written before um, the George Floyd stuff, but I think after this summer, it's still kind of timely. Who could register pollutions of the particulate physical or turn toward matters of lake acidification while their psyche doubted its own survival. I feel when I think of earth, my greenness is rotten, my feeling is rotten. My heart is meanly disconnected from you, friend, whose memory doesn't foam with toxic agitation when another story of black life devalued pulses through our consciousness. In me, each particle weathers the racial real. I bear it in my flow, in the underground of my attention. Your environmental alarm feels familiar, like someone's whisper of injustice, like a fact implored by mortal flesh. This flesh can't feel alarm that doesn't drive through the protective anodyne regulating my concern. My care is gone to the social, to tolerating the world as murderous atmosphere. What died in me is the earth. I can only yield so much to the oblivious culture. The petal of common feeling trampled over and over. Whiteness is a way of understanding the body that numbs when faced with its own melanin. Its eyes are brainwashed. My petals struggle in that light. Lately, my composure can't compose an unraced environment. Is it selfish that the self central love object of my gentle verse is the nerved within? I cherish a sensibility that questions the ownership of propriety and property. I create sounds in the behavioral wilds of terrified adults and trust that song tunes territoriality toward being. Say, your breathing shapes language into culture. Hear silence when all the breathers of the world are white or dead. My environment touches me. What kills the empathetic cellular kills resolve. 
such virulent communications of race hatred must be filtered through my pen. I sound brown where breath most breathes and intervene in the green mouths of men. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. That was wonderful, so moving and powerful. Uh, just really very, very much appreciate uh, you bringing that lens to this event. Uh, it's absolutely essential to this work. So thank you for everything that you're doing and uh, that beautiful writing. And thank you for sharing it with us today. Thanks, Heather. So next, I'd like to share with everyone a recorded welcome from Mayor Leonard Krogh of Nanaimo. Don't you love it when that happens? Bear with me just a moment. I'm going to see if a refresh does the trick on this. Can you unmute it, Heather? He was there. Sorry, yeah, he was there and then uh, something happened. I think I clicked one too many times or something and he disappeared. So I'm gonna bring him back again, sorry. What's an alternative to, to democracy? You just unclick someone and they're gone. <laughs> Heather, you have to unmute in order to play it, I think. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leonard Krogh. I'm the mayor of Nanaimo, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome all of you to the launch of the Nanaimo uh, Climate Hub, or the or a local aspect of the Community Climate Hub, which is starting all around the world. I want to first recognize that we are gathered on traditional territory, this name of First Nation, who were stewards of this land for thousands of years before contact and conscious of the legacy that they created as we look around the world at a planet that is in serious trouble in every aspect of its ecology. When we see burning in the Amazon, when we see growing pollution, when we see enormous sales of motor vehicles going to the roof, particularly larger vehicles, uh, we have to do what we can where we can. Uh, small is beautiful. What I hope will come out of you gathering today are not with great respect tirades about the state of the world, which I often engage in myself, but some practical down-to-earth solutions that we can implement locally, particularly through civic government, uh, in areas where we have jurisdiction, where we have control, and an opportunity to do something positive and to show leadership. The older I get, the more interested I am in the practical, things that actually work. I don't want to be sitting around in the boat uh, planning what color we're going to paint it in the springtime when the, we have a leak that needs repairing now. So I encourage all of you to think practically as you gather today. Offer real solutions, be prepared to collaborate, put aside political and partisan differences, which is one of the thrusts of this organizing meeting and one of the principles on which this whole organization, if you will, 
this whole collaboration, this worldwide collaboration is based. We are in this together and we each have a role in creating the problem and we each must face the fact that we have a more important role in solving the problems. So I encourage all of you to do the best you can. I want to thank you on behalf of a grateful community, all of the organizers and everyone involved for showing this leadership, hopefully shining a light forward on the path and we'll get through these dark times together. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you for bearing with me on the technical side. I hope you were all able to hear Mayor Krogh's message okay there. All right, so just before we hear a bit about the community climate hubs, we're just going to put up a couple of poll questions here. Uh, you might see the first one popping up on your screen there. I thought it'd be good to get a little bit of a sense from all of you of your own uh, experience and interests in the climate movement. So we'll just give folks a moment to respond to the question. We have 50 responded so far, coming up to 60, another 20 to go. Grab now, we've got three more, poll, four more polling questions after this, so let's... Um, yeah, feel free to cut it off, you don't have to wait for everybody to come in, some folks may have stepped away from your screen. So there's the results. Great. Okay, yep. so we can see we've got lots of veteran climate yep. activists here and a few new folks. Great. Yeah. And now we have poll number two, personal actions. Yeah, so this one you can, uh, you can select as many of these items as you like. Multiple choice. Yep. Multiple choice, yeah, sharing which are, which are some of the things that you've already done to reduce your own climate impact. I can life. see that everyone, there we go, now we're all, yeah. <laughs> 12, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And when we get to 70, well, we'll close it off. And we're coming up to everyone's, oh, 74, we're almost there. 75, we'll end the poll here and share the results. Wow, look at that. Wonderful. We have a very environmental bunch here. Who would have thought? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's fantastic so to see. Now we have a poll on Nanaimo climate solutions. Which solutions do you think are most needed in Nanaimo? Multiple choice. So there's some thinking to do first, obviously, but you can click as many of these as you want. One, two, ten, twenty, forty, fifty, sixty. Oh, you're good, you folks. Seventy <laughs> and seventy-five, and we're up to eighty. End the poll. Share the results. Okay, so our most popular ones there, uh, safe separated cycling and walking trails, uh, citizen engagement to help yeah. residents reduce their pollution. Those look like the top two yeah. choices there. So happy to see citizen engagement. And we have, I think, on relaunch, hang on, I don't want to continue. I want to end that poll and go to, oh yeah, simple ones. Where do you live? <laughs> this one should be easy. This should be very quick. <laughs> yep, 20, 30, 40, 50. Everyone knows they, where they live. No, and we're done. We're in there. 75, and we can look like up to 89. We're all. Seven didn't answer. We'll end okay. the poll. So. Okay, great. Yeah, so good to see a couple of folks. A couple of folks outside the regional district. So we're very strongly city and I know. I love that. Yes. yes. And finally, we have. Um, we launch poll five. Hang on, I've got to get this right. Yeah, your age. This should be a quick one, an easy one. Come on, the under 20s. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> oh, that's 80. It's all of us. End the poll. Share the results. Okay. 
Great. All right. Well, I'm glad we've got at least some from each category there. Yeah. Welcome to uh, those young and old. Good to see everybody here. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for sharing the polls there, Guy. Uh, so next up, I'm going to invite Matthew Chapman to speak as Climate Hub Project Manager at Climate Reality Canada and co-founder of the Montreal Climate Coalition. Matthew is devoted to developing local leaders for a sustainable economy. So Matthew, if you'd like to unmute yourself and go ahead, please do. Thank you very much, Heather and Guy, um, for the invitation. <clears throat> Climate Reality, I'd just like to mention, is um, commonly known, uh, here in commonly known as Montreal, um, it is an island in the St. Lawrence River that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. And we uh, recognize and respect uh, these nations and their, as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we um, here in Montreal uh, enjoy and share with them. Um, so the reason for which Climate Reality decided four and a half years ago to focus on supporting local citizen-led municipal decarbonization efforts was because there was a gap uh, in that space and because um, I was on staff at Climate Reality and had previously gotten involved at the municipal level um, a couple of years prior and believed very strongly in it. So I'm very, very, very happy to still be working on this project uh, with Climate Reality. Um, across the world, Climate Reality has about 25,000, maybe closer to 30,000 now after this year's trainings. Uh, people who've gone through a training with um, Al Gore about climate solutions and um, the, the crisis and its solutions, essentially. In Canada, <clears throat> we have approximately 1,400 people who've come through one of these trainings. Um, and essentially, that gives them uh, an additional network and just an additional kind of injection in the arm of inspiration and, and motivation. Uh, it is a lot of fun for um, for young and old and for experienced and um, neophyte climate activists. So highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to present to you th three kind of ways in which um, the uh, Canadian community, depending, uh, if you want to have an impact at the municipal level, um, there are essentially three ways that uh, I'd recommend that you do so, depending on kind of who you are and how you see yourself plugging in. Um, of course, this list is not exhaustive, but uh, we'll give you an idea. Uh, this is the program that I'm presenting today, the Climate Hub Initiative, how to get active locally, how to make change in your community um, as a citizen, as a, a resident, as an expert of your neighborhood. You know best your neighborhood. You know best the challenges of uh, you know, transportation, the challenges of waste. You see the, the day in, day out kind of things that, that happen. Um, the second initiative that I'd like to mention today, I won't be going into it very deeply, founded uh, in BC, um, the Climate Caucus. If you are a municipal councillor, if you are an elected official, or if you know an elected official and you are wondering, does that person really have their um, uh, talking uh, a good talk, but not maybe um, leaning into the climate issue as, uh, as far as they could? highly recommend that you suggest they join the Climate Caucus. So please take a look at that. The mission there um, outlined on, the, on the, their front page is, is pretty clear. I'm not sure if this is going to, um, no. Anyways, uh, there's a good long list of folks from across the country here. And I will quickly see, aha, we have Ben, who's already a member there in Nanaimo, also Tyler, also Aaron, and so there you have it. If there are any other uh, municipal councillors in the Nanaimo region that you'd uh, like to see on this list, this network of councillors from across the country helps uh, each other uh, with best practices, sharing uh, good ideas. Finally, if you're more of a, a technical um, policy wonk engineer, and or if you're already working within the city infrastructure trying to make change, um, and your interest is really the nitty gritty of, okay, how do we make this work? Um, the Urban Sustainability to Directors Network is the, the place for you. So I'm going to operate with the last 60 seconds that I have on the assumption that most of us in the room are, are not 
elected officials, nor do we work for the city. It could be that uh, you, you'll find those useful to suggest to other people. But I really want to quickly outline the resources we have available to you. Um, our objective is to support you in the rapid decarbonization of your um, municipality. Uh, there's a network of groups taking shape uh, across the country. One of our key uh, initiatives is the National Climate League, helping us benchmark cities, helping you guys decide uh, what to measure locally, uh, encouraging you to do so on an annual basis so that you can hold your elected officials to account, and then being able to compare those results across municipalities. Um, and that uh, those standings are available for download here at climatehub.ca. Another facet of our uh, support it takes the shape of webinars, uh, which there are now over 100 episodes to browse there, specific to the Canadian context and to solutions here. Uh, the Hub blog, very similarly, many um, uh, pieces there to explore about local solutions. We have assembled a toolkit, uh, including the things that I've just mentioned and others. And finally, probably the most important part is the network of regional organizers that exists to support your work. So again, if you um, head to climatehub.ca, you'll have the opportunity to uh, send these people an email um, in your region. It would be Jessica McElroy, um, based in North Vancouver. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, have a great meeting. I will have to put a baby to bed shortly, but I will, I'm really, really happy to be here and gonna listen in for another few minutes. Thanks very much, Matthew. Excellent, okay. Uh, so next I'd like to invite Paul Manley, who is the member of parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith to say a few words. Paul, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much, Heather. Um, and thank you to the Nanaimo Climate Hub and the organizers for putting this together and for working on this issue. We are here, I'm here in the traditional territory of the Nanaimo First Nation and uh, as Leonard Krogh said, the Mayor Krogh said that w we need to honor what they have uh, that done being stewards of this land. And I think that one of the key things we need to work on in this community is protecting the biodiversity uh, in, in our region. We are in an area that uh, was handed over as part of the ENN land grants. And when you look at the Nanaimo River watershed, 75 uh, or 750 square kilometers, 56 kilometer uh, river, uh, only 0.6 square kilometers are in park in that river and 10.4 uh, square kilometers are in conservation area, mostly at the top of Mount Benson. And I think with respect to uh, Snanamo, Staminas, Snanawis, we need to work on protecting the biodiversity in this region and I intend to do that through Indigenous protected conservation areas. Uh, when I spoke with Mosaic about this, they and I asked them about parks on the river, they said that nobody had ever approached them about parks on the river, unlike the Cowichan River. It's important to take local action and, and to uh, take action uh, at the municipal level, but we also need to recognize that a lot of things are, are done at a national level and collective action and holding government and industry to account is also very important. And I don't want people to let go of that, that piece. Uh, as a member of parliament, I'm on the federal climate caucus working across party lines on these issues. Some of the key things that we can do locally are relocalizing our food uh, production. I've been involved with that, with uh, promoting farmers markets, buy local campaigns, the urban farms at Five Acres, Westwood Farm, community gardens, school gardens, gleaning projects, the My CDC food forests, uh, you know, and just in your own backyard, uh, planting trees and bushes, and, and et cetera. There is a Farm uh, Credit Canada Agri Spirit Fund that's available to the municipality. Uh, it, it funds capital projects and sustainability projects. And the next round of that is coming up uh, March, 2021. I'm happy to talk to city officials about that. In terms of energy efficiency, there's lots we can do on our own. And there's the Canada Infrastructure Fund, uh, up to 40% uh, funding for municipal projects and relevant streams or public in, uh, transit, green infrastructure, community culture, recreation uh, projects and uh, bilateral agreements with the provinces. There's gonna be more funding coming for home energy retrofits. This is something I've done on my own. I've got uh, 
I've done two homes, uh, one a 1910 building, it's an energy star now, and uh, the food share energy efficient demonstration building was done in 1999, and now it's now a, a solar demonstration site. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the same kind of feed-in tariffs from BC Hydro that we used to have, and Site C has made it uncompetitive for renewable energy projects to have a distributive energy system, uh, something that would, that, uh, helps with climate mitigation. There's a zero emissions vehicle infrastructure fund and municipalities are eligible for that as well through uh, Enercan and um, RFPs are open for that soon, December 10th. There's disaster mitigation and adapt, uh, adaptation funding available to uh, cities to support large scale infrastructure projects to help uh, communities better manage the risk of disasters triggered by natural hazards. Um, and as I said, changing personal habits and local action isn't enough. You know, at Canada, we only account for 2% of global emissions, but we are the fifth highest emitters of GHG per capita, greenhouse gases per capita. And uh, the, the new Climate Transparency Accountability Act is not enough. Uh, we don't set new targets until 2010 or 2030. 10 years from now. We still have the Harper government targets of a 30% reduction over 2005 levels by 2030. Those are not the Paris targets. We should be, uh, the Paris targets are 45% decreased by 2030 and the IPCA is, uh, IPCC is now warning that we, that's not even enough. We need to be going to 60%. So we need to set an interim target and we need to pressure the federal government to take this on and we need to actually have a plan. Out of uh, the nine uh, commitments that we've made internationally for climate action, there was never a plan for one of them. The only government that's ever made a, a plan federally was the Paul Martin government. And so it's really important for citizens to con continue to work collectively to force the federal government to take action and uh, be accountable for the greenhouse gas emissions. And just one last thing, uh, UK reduced emissions by 42% over 1990 levels, while can Canadian emissions have increased by 21%, and that's because they have a carbon budget. The two, 2009 Copenhagen targets, uh, eight provinces and three territories were on track to meet those targets, but two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, have increased their greenhouse gases uh, by the same amount that the rest of those provinces reduced. And the oil and gas sector has become a big booming thing here in BC too, and the LNG Canada project is gonna blow our carbon budget out of the water. So we need to uh, not just be focusing on the, the local level, we need to focus on what our provincial and federal governments are doing. Thank so I'm so ha much, happy to take part and discuss this further as we go forward. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you for those helpful remarks. Lots of great ideas for where we might get some municipal funding for local projects. Uh, so yeah, thanks for being here and for contributing to not just today, but all the work that you do out there in the federal um, realm for us. So thank you. And next up, I'd like to invite Sheila Malcolmson to say a few words. She is our member of the Legislative Assembly for Nanaimo, and she's currently serving as the Parliamentary Secretary for Environment in BC government. Welcome, Sheila. Thanks, Heather. Really glad to be here. So I switched to my screen. Is that right now? I hit share screen. Yes, you can share your screen now if you'd like to share some slides. All right. Too. All right. So I want to uh, give thanks to the organizers for bringing us together. I acknowledge that I'm talking with you from Nanaimo territory and really honored to be uh, Nanaimo's link into the BC legislature. Uh, I can't count how long it's been that we've been talking about uh, climate action. And from the first time that I was elected in 2002, it's been at the front of the priority list and then falls back when we get hit with local emergencies, whether it's overdose crisis or homelessness, the work that comes immediately into our faces and is so personal. So I especially laud the organizers today for making sure that we are continuing to put climate at the forefront. This 
um, has been a long emergency forever, and I regret that we are not as far ahead as we'd like to be. Um, British Columbia on a national level has um, been lauded for the work that it's been doing at a policy level uh, for the second year in a row. We're the head of the rest of the country on uh, net zero energy ready building codes, on EV registrations, industrial energy management, low carbon heating. I definitely give credit to the uh, BC Liberal government at the very beginning of their term, you know, 18 years ago, set some good work that was leading the province um, at, and in leading the country in many ways. Um, and in this previous legislature, the climate plan that um, we developed, the NDP and the Greens together, is a continent leading. Um, but I'm going to really try to bring this conversation down to the very local level. So what can we do as a provincial government to partner with the city of Nanaimo um, to actually implement what the citizen demand is? So I just want to really talk from a process point of view. Um, if you want, like what Courtney got, uh, this really awesome um, mixed, you know, dealing as you can see with a storm water runoff, uh, a true act of transportation uh, path. This took a lot of partnership, federal gas tax money, provincial money, a city of Courtney um, coming together. This is the kind of infrastructure that we want to see. It needs to be municipally led. So for this kind of micro level, which is truly where we get to, to walk our talk, uh, the citizens come together, they get progressive councillors that go to city council um, to say these are what our priorities are, and then they come to me, I go to the legislature and advocate. Our government is investing in infrastructure like and in people, like has never happened in the history of the province, but this is our time. It's so important to make sure that that infrastructure has that people and climate lens. Um, so that's Courtney there. Um, this is the city of Nanaimo version that's kind of underway right now, both provincially funded. This is still at the, um, at the um, thinking phase. And I know that my city friends are gonna talk more about this, but this is another example of provincial money um, that was requested by the city, that was pushed by the people through a public process, the province funds it. It's my honor to advocate for stuff like that. This is Matral Drive. Um, electric vehicle network, um, we've, with the, Regional District of Nanaimo. So in that case, it was the RDM that we partnered with another 10 EV charging um, sites uh, announced in September. Um, this has been going on through the whole three and a half years that we've been in government. Um, also legislating uh, electric vehicle sales. They're already 9% of BC sales, which is fantastic, partly because of the incentives that are out there that a lot of you advocated for. But we've now legislated, you can't sell an electric vehicle in the year um, you have, you can only sell electric vehicles in the year 2050. 9% now, the um, legislative requirement is 30% by 2030, 100% by 2040. Um, here's another example of infrastructure climate friendly. This is the Nanaimo Aboriginal Centre uh, Affordable Housing. Uh, passive energy design, 80% uh, or 90% less. Uh, so we pay for the affordable housing if we require provincially a climate lens. Then also the um, Brecon Road affordable housing, United Church is another example of that passive energy. When we are spending public money, we want it to have a climate lens and that happens when we partner with the, with the regional district. Uh, I'll leave you with that just as an image of what we can do when we work together and uh, so grateful uh, to all the citizens. Guy Dauncey, your energy is amazing. I just, we want to tap into that. Um, thank you for bringing us together and um, I'd love to participate um, in any way that I can to support your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Wonderful to hear from you. Uh, it's great to see those inspiring images of some things that are happening already and uh, that we're all working together to see where we can go next. So um, now I'd just like to invite Emma Sima Provencal to say a few words. Uh, she's the co-founder and chair of the Vancouver Island University Co Club. Go ahead, Emma. Uh, thanks, Heather, for that introduction. Can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Uh, I just want to say how grateful I am for how many people I see on this Zoom call. It's really awesome and inspiring see how, seeing how many people um, want to get more climate initiatives in Nanaimo. Uh, as Heather said, I'm the chair of the Eco Club up at VIU, and I started this club 
back in January 2019 with a friend, which with everything that's happened this year, that feels like ages ago. <laughs> um, yeah, and we just kind of wanted to have something at VIU that really focuses students on getting some green initiatives done. Um, so I'm gonna keep this super short and sweet. And I just kind of wanted to come on here and say that we're always open for partnerships and the Eco Club is always looking for more people to do projects with. Um, and we love to hear what the community is doing and what you guys are up to. So um, if there's any groups or individuals who want to get in contact with us, we're kind of a way to um, bridge you into like the university or sort of young adult age group as well. Um, so if you wanted to contact us, uh, we have a Facebook and an Instagram. It's at VIU Eco Club, or we also have an email. I'll put that stuff in the chat, but you can also just Google us. I'm pretty sure our social medias are somewhere on there. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming to this event. This is super awesome and I'll pass it on to Heather to introduce the next speaker. Great. Thank you so much for being here, Emma, and for helping us reach that younger generation. Okay, so we're going to take a shift over now into talking more specifically about the Reimagine Nanaimo initiative. So as we listen to the next couple of speakers, I'd like to just invite everybody maybe to type uh, into the chat one or two changes that you would really like to see specifically in Nanaimo, so more at that municipal level. Um, so first off, I'd like to welcome Rob Lawrence, who's an environmental planner with the city of Nanaimo. Welcome, Rob. Hello. Thanks for uh, inviting me, uh, Heather and Guy. I really appreciate this, and it's really impressive to see how many people are attending. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides I'd like to uh, go over with you. And you're right, I'm going to be uh, chatting a little bit about uh, Reimagine Nanaimo and, um, and the work that we're uh, doing down on that level. But I'm also going to touch, uh, touch base a little bit on uh, some of the results we're seeing from some of the uh, climate mitigation projections. And I think it might be a uh, some good food for thought for our discussion as we kind of go through uh, this afternoon and actually as uh, all the members of today's forum uh, go away and think about maybe some other ideas and initiatives the city might need to be thinking about as we kind of walk through the uh, reimagined process and um, in my mind this is a, an amazing opportunity to look at climate action but integrated with so many other plans and policies that are also going to be concurrently updated at the same time as part of this process the oc the official community plan for example so much of the land use uh policy and 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 direction is speaks to, it speaks to that our parks and uh, recreation culture plan update which uh has, is is hasn't been updated since 2005 but there's so many initiatives, ideas that can be incorporated into parks planning and acquisition planning going forward. Active transportation plan, this would be our first uh, for the city. So looking at how on an integrated citywide basis, how can we do a better job at uh, providing uh, safe, accessible, alternative transportation for, for residents of the city. Um, and obviously an economic development plan, again, looking, looking at perhaps with a new lens uh, about m looking at how we can not so much always be looking at, uh, uh, you know, increasing uh, profit margins, but looking at well-being and looking at how we can better, uh, better uh, sustain the community overall. And perhaps that's something we can discuss further today. And our water supply strategic plan with the climate uh, change and the requirements that we're going to have to consider through adaptation. This plan is particularly important for what, how we're going to look at how we secure future supply and how we share that with uh, the community, but also the region as well. So when we're looking at the process, you know, overall, this is, we are in the first phase really. So this is really just beginning right now. So it's and it's all about gathering ideas and engaging engaging the public through events like this and and talking to our neighbors and and community groups and just hearing and listening to what people see as important and what are the priorities that need to be addressed now and uh, have that as um in the back of our minds as we work forward with our consultants to to uh, develop a series of options of policies of programs that we can present back to the community likely in the late winters early spring in in 2021 as we go forward 
Another round of the draft documents will be provided to the public for input and we're hoping that this entire uh, process will be completed by this time next year. So a lot of work to be done, Very, it's very aggressive. There's a lot of significant plans that I think will have some major impact on how we grow and develop and how we see our community going forward that need to be looked at carefully and how we can build on the synergies of all these documents together. So it's a definitely exciting time to be engaged in this. So definitely, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't already, go to our reimagine at website. Take, take some of the uh, questionnaires, look at some of the background information and share it with your friends and neighbors and continue the discussion. So really encourage that. So uh, just before I, uh, I sign off real, I wanna kind of go through a couple of points on some, uh, some, of, some of the data that's been collected by our consultants, just to give you some background. As has been discussed earlier, we, since uh, April 2019, we've adopted a, a climate emergency uh, uh, declaration with some aggressive targets that look at z net zero uh, emissions by 2050 and that, that following the IPCC uh, goal for that period of time. And this is an extremely aggressive target for a local government, particularly when you're considering the, uh, the powers that a local government has as opposed to a provincial or a federal government. So it definitely speaks to the importance of all levels of government and the community working together to make this a success. And I think we have heard this a couple of times already, compromise and working together is gonna to be very key. Clearly, it's, it's pretty, it's, I don't think it's any, uh, any, any illusion that it's, it's gasoline, diesel, natural gas, oil heating, and hot water is the, are the main issues. And that's from the, the single, fa single occupancy vehicle use, but also home and commercial heating and hot water use. And it's looking at new construction and also existing uh, homes that, uh, that have lower energy efficiency standards. As far as policy is concerned, there's, there's certainly a legacy and, and a lot of examples that the city has completed to date, whether it's our uh, GHG emissions reduction to, uh, targets and our earlier OCPs, our, uh, our first climate mitigation plan, our transportation master plan, but also more recently adopting uh, the energy step code and through our building bylaw and uh, through some incentives through our rezoning policy through density bonusing. And currently we, we do have a program through Clean BC where we're doing home energy retrofit top ups in addition to what BC Hydro and the province offer homeowners who switch out to uh, heat pumps and a whole, other, uh, a whole range of other uh, upgrades that a homeowner can make to make their home more energy efficient. But I think the the reality check is when we look at is when we look at our emissions levels and um, well, when comparing between 2010 and 2017, we are seeing that trend continue, irregardless of all the policies and targets that the city has adopted. We are still rising, and I think. Cut in here, Rob. But if you can just wind it up in a few seconds, we are out of time. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, real super quick. The trends for the long term are, are also going to be not, not good. It's, we're not going to meet our, our emergency targets with the current policies we have. We need to be creative and look at uh, some solutions a little more deeply. Um, last point, climate adaptation. Well, there's a lot of uh, changes coming through our weather and sea level rise, and these are other additional challenges that need, need to be addressed, and through, again, through this process as well. Anyway, sorry I took too long, but uh, that gives you a very high level overview. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I know it's a tall order getting everybody to cram their, you know, career work into just five short minutes. So um, appreciate the overview there and a bit of an introduction into the uh, reimagined sort of public engagement questionnaire process. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Ben Gesselbracht, who's an Nanaimo City Councillor and is a strong voice for environmentally sustainable and socially communities. Welcome, Ben. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me uh, come speak today, uh, speaking uh, on the Suname territory. Um, it's really grateful to see the, the turnout today uh, and the, the grassroots organizing of the Nanaimo Climate Action Hub. Uh, hubs are nodes of collaboration, and I'm grateful to see uh, the large number of organizations that are focused on climate action as sponsors of this event. Um, there, there is real strength in numbers. Uh, my hope uh, 
is that the city of Nanaimo and our regional district are seen as collaborators and uh, most importantly um, as enablers. Um, and that's enablers of, of community grassroots action um, in what I think is the most important task uh, that uh, humanity has in front of it. And that's rebuilding human settlements that can operate within the means of, of the planet. Uh, we definitely have to double down here in Nanaimo uh, towards this vision of a, of a thriving community um, that respects the well-being of all people and the, the health of the whole planet. And, and we definitely have our work uh, cut out for us. Uh, Rob uh, pointed uh, out that, you know, 10 years ago, we set uh, to have our emissions 33% below our 2000 levels by 2020. And uh, it's now 2020 and we're actually 18% higher uh, of, of, of our emissions. And uh, we've actually, our emissions have grown quicker than our population. And, and that is in large part because we're switching our homes from a renewable uh, energy source of hydro to natural gas. Uh, so the, the major direct source of our emissions are um, from buildings and transportation. And, and what that means is that we really need to focus our policies on switching our fuel sources um, and, and decreasing uh, demands. Uh, what, you know, a lot of work that I'm focused on is uh, noticing that our emissions calculations don't really capture um, uh, the, the carbon footprint that's embodied uh, in uh, that's embodied carbon in the production, transportation, um, and manufacturing of goods, food, and packaging. And so there's an EPA study that found that 37% of greenhouse gases came from the provision um, use of goods, another 12% from the provision of food, and 1% from infrastructure. So 50% of the greenhouse gases come from our, our use of, of goods, uh, services, and food. Um, and um, so that really makes uh, policies around zero waste, circular economy, waste reduction very important. And the city of Amsterdam has really recognized this. They figured that the greenhouse gas associated with that is about 66%. And their circular Amsterdam uh, vision hopes to reduce that by two thirds by their, their greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And so we, we do have similar policies that we're building here, the regional district, a 90% diversion from landfill, and, and, and also looking to have. Um, mandatory source separation for everybody for our organics and waste. Um, protecting our natural assets also is a really important um, item like our streams, rivers, lakes, and forest lands. Um, and that green infrastructure, uh, one, is a lot less carbon intensive than the gray infrastructure to accomplish that, those tasks, um, but also it's our, our natural carbon sequestration. And so it's really important that we strengthen our policies in that. So, you know, we are uh, mobilizing heavily at the city of Nanaimo and regional district. Um, to support our community to take more responsibilities for its emissions. Um, we're, we're actively in the process of updating our, our climate action plans, both at the district and the city. And right now it's a really important time uh, for the community to mobilize and demand strong ambitious action um, from, from local government. And so, uh, you know, as elected official that believes strongly about climate action, I really depend on the community to, to be loud, especially in under important decisions. We've got a budget coming up where there's gonna be decisions on hiring a, a manager for sustainability and community emissions, a more investment in active transportation, um, more, more purchasing and protection of parks. And uh, we need to hear that it's important to the community. Uh, also, uh, you know, action at the end of the day, it happens at the ground level. It's, it's all about changing habits. So changing our, our purchasing habits, building more localized supply chains, changing the way that we transport around our, our, our distances to work. Um, and supporting each other and making the right choices. And, and when we're experimenting and problem solving at the grassroots level, when we come up to situations where there's no way unless we get higher, higher order help from the, from the province or the federal government, the local government, you know, to, because we nowhere can we get a product that we need that's not made out of plastic or we don't have, you know, access to the right transportation. That's where our experimenting and our problem solving, solving provides valuable information of what we need. And, and that's what's really important for me as an elected official is to hear from the community. And I really wanna see Nanaimo be an extremely loud collective advocate at the provincial and federal level on building this new green circular economy of the future. So um, lots of exciting things. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to uh, collaborating in, in the action of this hub, thanks. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you for all the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, really, really can't agree with you more that we just very much need lots of voices in Nanaimo um, to all, all be encouraging this uh, good direction so we can do this 
important and yet difficult work that's ahead of us. So uh, at this point, I would like to invite Guy Dauncey to say a few words. Guy is an author, an activist, and the founder of the BC Sustainable Energy Association, and he is one of the co-organizers of today's event. Heather, is Tyler not next? Tyler Brown? Oh, you're correct. Thank you for catching that guy. Yes, uh, Tyler is another Nanaimo City Councillor whom I scrolled past a little too quickly on my screen. Um, and uh, sorry, Tyler is the Councillor who brought forward the resolution to officially declare a climate emergency in 2019. So uh, yes, please go ahead, Tyler. Uh, thank you, Heather. And uh, um, thank you, Heather and Guy for organizing this. I, the day-to-day -day grind of, uh, you know, I know Ben and I don't want to talk daily and the day-to-day -day grind of trying to advance some of these stuff can be draining and exhausting. And I know probably everybody here knows that and feels that. So when you see a group like this come together, uh, it can be really energizing and sort of fill the cup back up and then you can get back at it the next day. Um, and also just uh, thank you to uh, Sam Kwaton for starting us off right. It's always good to have uh, have the welcome and the, um, and uh, acknowledgement of the territory that we we do reside on and uh, should be sort of important and top of mind of all the work that we do. Um, I, you know, I was trying to think about things that I wanted to say, and I think Ben and Rob covered a lot of. Uh, um, uh, ben and I both sit on the uh, the regional district as well, and there's a, there's a lot of interplay there between the city and the the region on on these items, and uh, you know, for example, transit is a as a regional district um, uh, service. I was trying to think of you know what to talk about and I'm finding it increasingly harder, I'll just be very honest, to talk about climate change. I don't, I don't know what to say anymore. Um, uh, the, facts, the facts have been in front of us for, uh, for a long time, but I even know at university, um, you know, it was, uh, I saw Don Alexander in here earlier, we were talking about it in his classes and it was, you know, it just really felt like uh, maybe I was naive in university, but progress was being re being made. And then as the as the data starts to come out, it's just increasingly dire um, circumstance. And that's talking about climate change, not even talking about biodiversity loss and and the destruction of the natural environment. Um, so I've been really sort of I'm uh, sort of going off off my notes here, but I've been really trying to. Uh, reshape and reform how I think about about this particular topic and and when I do I, I have uh, two young children uh, one of them is about to turn two and one's just over three uh, I've really started to I find my mind drifting and starting to imagine what I want the world to look like uh, 20 30 years from now for them uh, and really it comes down to one that's healing uh, one that is taking these issues seriously and honestly because I think I think in a lot of ways, we, we're not uh, uh, always being in the general discussions that we're having in society, not being honesty, honest with the, sort of the magnitude and the severity of the situation. Uh, you know, if we, I know I sit on two local government bodies. Um, uh, you know, I think if we were fully understanding and grasping the situation and confronting it honestly, it would be the resources that would, we would be dedicating to it at the local level, at the provincial level, at the federal level, uh, would be things that we had never seen before. You know, almost like that COVID response. Uh, that is what's required, that, that wartime response that people talk about. So, you know, Rob sort of touched upon our targets aren't being met. So I, I really do encourage people to take part of the reimagine and NIMO process, spell out some of the great things I've been seeing in the chat and some of the ideas that I know get floated around from for many of you that uh, write counsel or reach out. But I really think it's gotta be that uh, that day-to-day -day commitment of holding elected officials accountable, uh, to keeping track of their work, uh, to being relentless in your discussions with them and your advocacy with them, because I've seen how that can shape public policy in a positive way, and I've also seen it how it can shape public policy in a negative way. Um, because when we ask, you know, uh, 
speaking about university, it was the first time that I sort of heard uh, or was exposed to some of the ancient Greek thinkers. And uh, at that time, I, I realized, hey, economy and ecology actually have the same, they have the same root, uh, which is that eco and that's home. And economy is the management of the home. And too often we're focused on the economy, but I don't think by any metric you could say we've managed our home well, which is what sort of economy talks about. So there's so much we could be doing and we could be doing it now, not in 2030, not in 2050. You know, planning is great, but it needs, we need action now. And, you know, increased transit service. Um, I saw the electric buses and I think that would be awesome. And, and we're going to be getting to electric buses, but like even just getting more people on CNG buses or diesel buses is so much more progress than having so many people driving around. All that active transportation stuff, it's great. We're making progress. We're doing more now than ever, but it's not enough. It needs to be accelerated uh, by a significant amount. Building retrofits, all those sort of things. So yes, let's get it in the reimagine and IMO process. Let's uh, do all that work and let's get those policies in place and support for those policies. But at the same time, let's be advocating now our advocating for action now and i think that's what's great about this type of group is i see so many people so let's come together and and sustain pressure and keep the pressure on i'm out of time so much more i could say but thank you thank you tyler your um your real your genuine concern is uh is wonderful to just see that we have representation on our uh, city council from folks who who truly get it and, and understand the magnitude of this situation. Um, so thank you for sharing your, your experience with that and uh, for your encouraging words of how we can all get this sorted out together. Okay, so take two, Guy. This time it's actually your turn if you'd like to go ahead. Sure, so um, thanks. Let me just put this one in in place together. So um, thanks everyone. We'll be, I'm the last speaker after this, we'll be doing 10 minutes in breakout groups. We have a real sense of urgency that is real urgency around this. We can't have goals set in the year 2050, which say to people that go to sleep, there's no hurry here. Behind COVID, there's the massive crises of climate crisis and the biodiversity collapse looming, and we need to pay just as much attention to them. I've been involved in this field for 25 years, writing two major books and then founding the BC Sustainable Energy Association. And I'm not burnt out at all. I'm just raring to go. Back in the spring, in January of this year, I wrote a major paper for the federal government showing how the federal government can really take things seriously in a 20-week, six-week transition program. And back in September, just before the election, I wrote this paper called 50 Ways to Bring More Urgency to BC's Climate Action Plans, which you can find on my website at thepracticalutopian.ca. The last time the world was three degrees warmer, the sea level was 25 meters higher. And that's the temperature we're heading towards. That's Vancouver with only a five meter sea level rise to show you the, the deep distress that this is going to cause if we don't get it really under control. I'm on the same page as Seth Klein in his new book, um, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. I believe we should treat this with the same level of urgency and investment and mobilization that we did at the beginning of World War II. Seth says the level of ambition is nowhere near where we need to be. These federal and provincial plans are painfully slow. They do not reflect or communicate a sense of urgency. The NIMO's climate action pollution is 63% um, from transport, 31% building, 6% organic waste. Total 585,000 tonnes of CO2 and CO2 equivalent a year. So how can we get this down to zero? In 2010, the NIMO City Council set a community-wide target of a 33% reduction by 2020. The NIMO's musicians, musicians just went on rising. Now there's a new target for a 50% reduction by 2030. How can we achieve it? We need a you know, good old Nanaimo bar. We need urgent messaging in the media and in general. We need efforts and initiatives from individuals, schools, VIU, the business and community and business community leadership. And we need the RDN city and our, the city and RDN leadership. Put together a good, but not too much sugar, please. And I have five personal suggestions to put in here. So in Britain during World War II, victory would not have been possible without the millions of people who volunteered to join the Red Cross, the YMCA, Women's Voluntary Service, the John's Ambulance Brigade, so on. Where's today's equivalent? Notice that she's growing food on top of her bombshell. <laughs> Where's today's equivalent? When we come to personal climate leadership, there's no support, no training, no coordination. This is what we have to change. I probably want to put the 2% solution. Step one, 12 people, 
from this group right now volunteer to become climate leaders. Our goal is to become 100% climate friendly household in transport, home, waste and food within one year by December of next year. Step two, those people set up a support group to help and encourage each other. If 60 people volunteer, we'd have five support groups to be climate leaders. Step three, we help them train them to become climate block leaders. Each climate block leader helps 20 families on their block to become climate friendly, learning from what they've learned themselves. The goal is that 50% of all households on your street are 100% climate friendly by 2025 and 100% by 2030. So Nanaimo has 90,000 people, 36,000 households, a trained climate leader for every 20 households, 2% of the population is climate leaders, that's 1,800 trained climate leaders by 2024, starting with 150 next year. It's a doable task. Who will lead this, who will fund it, all has to be determined. Might you volunteer to become a climate leader? We're going to do a Zoom, quick Zoom poll, and also you can send an email to me at guydauncey at earthfuture.com and get a stop sharing. Do the poll, um, find the new poll, climate leaders, relaunch poll six, continue. There we go. Are you interested to become a climate leader as described? We're up to 20 people, 30 people, 40, 50, 60, coming up to 65. So this is fantastic. Look, we've got, we've got, I'm going to share this poll and show you how amazing this is. We've got 15 people right off the top said, yes, I am. We got our first group and another 37 are saying maybe. So look, um, that's fantastic. I got to share the results. I didn't show you that. <laughs> Sorry. There's the results. 15 saying yes. Send me an email, guydauncey.earthfuture.com and we'll get it going. So I can stop sharing and move on. Close that. Continue. <laughs> share screen. There we go. Share screen. There we go. So number two is schools leadership school district 68 has already said in the underlying piece they've approved a strategic plan in which one of its goals is to be a leader in climate environmental stewardship and sustainability we need to give them all the support they can we work with them help them support them and make this a reality so that school district 68 is the most leadership leaderly in the province number three transportation leadership 1890s, we were all horses. By the 2020s, it was all cars. It happened. These transitions happen. 1990s were all cars. By 2020s, we can be all smart streets, pedestrian-friendly streets, cycling-friendly streets. 88% of the Nanaimo city trips are by car. 9% by foot, 2% public transport, only 1% by bicycle at the moment. We need to, we already have Nanaimo has its complete streets guidelines. That's that's a really good beginning. We need to go further and look at the idea of what's called low traffic neighborhoods, when entire little city blocks, no through traffic, residents only. So this is how they're doing it in Britain. They'll actually block the block off. You know, Farage can get through if need be, but otherwise there is resistance to that. The same people who say screw you when it comes to wearing a mask say screw you when it comes to not, you know, driving wherever they want to. So that's a reality of neighborhood life. Increase bus ability. The same bus can get all those cars and motorbikes off the street. Increase cyclability. This means safe, separated bike lanes, not just a painted line on the sidewalk where you get swiped by a big mirror. Increased EV ability. By 2025, an EV with 400 kilometers range will cost the same as a conventional car. In China, you can buy a car like that right now for $4,000. Increased um, electric charging infrastructure from the Mid-Island um, Electric Vehicle Association, that's their logo. So we need to campaign for that as well. Number four, green buildings. Our buildings produce 180,000 tons a year. It's oil furnaces and gas heaters that we need to shut down and really put them out of the picture. We need a massive building retrofit program in partnership with the provincial government and the federal government. We need to require that all new buildings are passive house designed by 2023, not by 2032. That the step code is far too slow. It allows laziness at every level. And we need business leadership. There's where I get my haircuts. You'll all recognize that place. Um, we get businesses signing up for Climate Smart, becoming part of the Vancouver Iron Greed Business Collective and stuff like that. And business leadership for a donut economy, thinking in a bigger scale, and for a sort of a recircular economy instead of a linear or just a recycling economy. We need a positive vision 
of a sustainable future. My time is up. It's a climate emergency. Some people say, are you pessimistic or optimistic? If you're watching the Canucks play, yeah, you're pessimistic or optimistic. If you're a player, you're either determined or defeated. As far as I'm concerned, that's the only game in town. We just need to be determined. We need to dream it, plan it, do it. That's my website. And um, now we're into the groups. That's good. I'm going to stop sharing and put us straight into open to all, open all rooms. Oh my goodness. How do I not assign automatically? Close all rooms. I got to. Okay, be patient with you. You can have fun in the breakout groups while I sort this one out. Um, okay, I've. Heather, can you advise me on this one? Is there a thing around breakout groups? Oh, I thought I'd had this organized. Uh, sorry, yeah, I just ended up in a breakout room there. I'm not sure if others did. Okay, I'm uh, just now creating 20 rooms. Okay, just hold on before you send everyone in there, though. We should just tell them what they're doing before they go. Yes, okay. Um, so we're going to take 10 minutes in breakout groups of four. And each group, uh, we'd like you to share your ideas on how you imagine Nanaimo as a climate-friendly city. So what are some of these, these goals and changes that we want to aim for? We'd like one person in each group to just volunteer to be the facilitator. That means your job is going to be to make sure that everybody in the group just gets a chance to speak within the 10 minutes. So um, then you can rejoin the meeting when you're done or you'll automatically be brought back at the end of the 10 minutes. We'll give you a five minute uh, reminder when we're halfway through. So once again, one person facilitates, everybody shares ideas for how we imagine Nanaimo as a climate friendly city. Now we're ready. And Heather, can you confirm this is working okay at your end? Hi, Guy. I got my computer um, went off charge and it took me a long time to get back in. Hmm. How did you, how are you not in a group? You're not in a breakout group? No, no, because it just as you were talking, it just went black. Hey, so. I just wonder if I can assign you. Let me see. Um... I missed what you were saying. <laughs> oh. Half of it anyway, but. Well, it'll be, it's all been recorded. Um, I'm, you're in a group now.
Okay, looks like we are all popping back into the main meeting. Okay, so um, at this point, I'm wondering if anyone would like to share back to the group a couple of key ideas that came out of that. Uh, so you're welcome to type those into the chat if you like, or um, if you want to just do the hand raise function or wave at me, um, and I'll try to call out people uh, by name, and you can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, Rob Lawrence, I see your hand there. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's only a couple of points, but it was it was it was a couple of good ones too about um, a really looking at focusing on um, completing some uh, really key, key uh, projects like uh, like complete streets and getting a, a complete trail system not in a in a kind of a piecemeal fashion but from from, from key destinations maybe even uh, you know neighborhood hubs for example as opposed to doing it in, in pieces which is done by development and uh, as a way of kind of paying for the for the upgrades but I think what I was hearing was it's uh, for many, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're going to do it, just be committed and finish it from one one destination to another within the city. And I and that's a good that's a good that's a good thought. Uh, and, and also some concerns and, and about the uh, ask the switch between aspiration and implementation. How do you kind of uh, keep that momentum going and and without uh, running out of energy? And uh, but I think uh, what I heard in guys talk about the climate leaders maybe on a neighborhood scale might be a solution to that so we, we, we spoke about that a little bit as well anyway those are a couple you. of points okay and uh, Sonnet raised her hand as well please go ahead Sonnet hi um, in our group I'll lower my hand um, in our group the, the focus on um, transport and good public transport and incentives to use that tr public transport um, support with it to, to make to, to actually um, be kind to the, our, our transit riders by giving them adequate shelter to wait at bus stops and lighting for their safety to use uh, public transit um, kept coming up. Uh, we talked a bit about urban sprawl and curtailing urban sprawl as something that we would like to see um, use of and then use of solar uh, on multifamily houses. I, I, I like the multifamily houses idea rather than these big huge properties I don't know and then um, urban food and sustainable sustainable sort of edible like landscapes uh, planted by the city rather than just making it um, private citizens doing that and and then I, I talked a little bit about wanting support and cultural uh, support for being able to bring our own containers to, to, to stores and grocery stores so that we can really um, do the zero waste thing. Nice, thank you so much. Those are some great, great ideas. I think Jessica was the next to put up her hand. Go ahead, Jessica. We cannot hear you, Jessica, if you are speaking. She's unmuted, so I don't know why Jessica's gone. Maybe move on. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to you, Jessica. Uh, next was Brian Short. Brian, if you want to go ahead. Hi, yes. Uh, well, a lot of the discussion in the group was, uh, I'll try and get some of the new ideas that we came up with. Um, one would be the uh, increasing organic diversion from the landfill, uh, because that's something that's fairly easy to do, and it's, we're doing, we do much better at it. Uh, an audit of the recycling uh, that's going out of the city to see where it's going to make sure that it is site recycled and then report back to the people of the city to uh, tell them it's not really getting recycled it's going into garbage and maybe we can reduce our uh, our um, waste at that point so that um, um, better insulation etc on buildings and increasing the subsidies for that and one new one was the VIU is not very sustainable at this point and they don't have a lot of policies in place that will support sustainability and that we could pressure VIU as a public institution to do better. Great, thank you Brian. Uh, I'll come back to Jessica for a moment to see if your audio is working there. 
We cannot hear you. Must be maybe a problem with your microphone. Might have to put your thoughts into the chat for us. <laughs> One more time. Oh, now we can hear you. Okay. Because <laughs> it was just working in our breakout group. Um, our, this is important because our group consisted of, uh, I'm in South Wellington. We had someone from uh, Lady Smith, someone from Protection Island, someone who works in Parksville, and someone in Nanus. And so one of our key things was that we need to think regionally. Um, we need to talk about getting our communities connected because we all experience barriers to uh, participating in active transportation. So we should focus on creating infrastructure that is not car centric, including down, you know, like that's connecting to our uh, um, regional communities, uh, traffic calming, light rail, finding a way to getting our kids to school that is more um, active transport friendly. And another thing, two of us are farmers. And so the regional perspective would allow us to connect to us farmers and uh, you know, allow us to enhance our food security by connecting our local food sources into the city. So whatever infrastructure that could support that. Um, at the core, our, someone said it best as saying, and I didn't I miss the name, um, getting our communities connected. And and sorry, and dream big. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, I think next was Paul. Yep, so um, the group that I had, the first thing was uh, somebody who lives out in Mackey Road near Living Forest Campground uh, was saying that we need better transit in the city just for getting kids to and from school. And uh, I think it's that's a key issue for a lot of people. Um, I'm in favor of more active transportation and safe cycling. I've been hit by cars twice, both uh, both times a driver's fault. And and so cycling around in the city, I like to see uh, safe spots to be able to do that. And I know that there's that there's federal funding for that. Access to growing food. Uh, somebody was mentioning that they just have a small home. They live in a tiny home, so they don't have a garden space and they want to see more community gardens. Their kids go to Forest Park School, so community gardens there. And then somebody at Dover, whose kids go to Dover, um, they work on the food forest there. They want to see more uh, food forests around the community. Uh, one of the other members was saying energy efficient homes uh, with less use of uh, LNG. And um, that means heat pumps and we need to Ask, ask the city to actually revisit the heat pump bylaw to allow um, quiet rated heat pumps to go in into the front of people's properties again, because uh, now they can only go in backyards or side yards. And in some places it's just not possible to, to uh, have a, a heat pump installed. Um, and then stronger policy to deal with the plastic waste that's around the community and moving towards zero waste. And, um, you know, back to that old animal recycling exchange model or banning plastic bags, uh, getting on on the um, onto that. I, I know that was a motion I brought to the city four years ago, so banning single use plastic bags. And I think now that we know that we can do it, we should just do it. Great, thank you, Paul. And we have one more hand raised, which is Nina. I think Nina and Charles there with you as well. Yeah, um, so I, I just was going to say that in our group, although I'm realizing you were the spokesperson, actually, um, but we talked a lot about um, the local food issue and how important that is to, to the sort of 100 mile diet or to, to eat locally and, and yeah, that you can do it yourself to some degree too. all of those things and the making when you look at housing that if you um, it was brought up by Wally, how um, he was told by a biologist that you need to look at first what's going on with the, the natural setting there, you know, putting the biodiversity and, and the wild wilderness first. And that was also mentioned by Susanna. And, you know, I felt strongly about it. I think all of us did. So it was really neat. We very much overlapped on our Thanks. themes. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. Uh, okay, so um, at this point, I, I know we wanted to do our best to get to some questions from the group that maybe have been put in the chat uh, throughout this event. 
Um, we were wanting to uh, probably try and wrap things up in the next 15 minutes or so. People are going to be wanting to get into their dinners. Um, but maybe just one or two questions. Uh, Ellen, I'll ask Laura, who's been keeping an eye on the chat for us, uh, if you maybe have picked out one or two uh, questions that we might put to some of our speakers just before we do the wrap up. For sure. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but some of the questions that have come up, um, one of them specifically um, is to the city of, um, to city of Nanaimo. Um, and it's just regarding sea level rise scenarios that were apparently on the website um, at some point. Um, if it's possible to have those, um, to have the sea level rise scenarios um, made available to the public again. So um, not nothing to necessarily have to answer right now, but if that information is available, um, you could link it in the I, chat. I can tell you it's on the city webpage and yeah, I can send the link. The maps and the study are available. Great. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. And is there um, one more question we might get to? Yeah, so another question was specifically for Sheila Malkinson, and it was just regarding um, the what the province's plans are regarding the carbon tax, and will it be um, will it be increased? Yeah, another um, here's another COVID hit. Um, so it was on track for it's already been increased um, while we've been in government. It was on track for being increased. Very strong lobby at an affordability level to delay the increase. So super, if folks want to let me know where that sits in their level of priorities, uh, Sheila.Malcolmson.MLA at leg.bc.ca. I understand that after two weeks of that email the whole province's legislative email has been down for two weeks. I hear today it's back. Um, and apologies if you've written to me and I, you just got to bounce back. Everybody is experiencing it. Um, so yeah, it's great. I would love to be an advocate for this. Um, we've got a $12 billion hit to the provincial treasury and all kinds of people oh. losing their livelihood. So we got a strong lobby to delay the increase of the carbon tax, but let me know if you feel differently and I'll represent that. Thank you, that's wonderful. And just a little tip for anyone who might want to follow up on Sheila's suggestion to email her. Uh, we can always suggest that we have a fully transparent and fully returned to the citizens kind of a model um, for our carbon pricing increase so that every penny of that increased um, carbon fee would be returned back to households in BC, meaning that it would actually not negatively affect and would positively affect most people's bottom line. Um, so I'm just going to throw that in there. Guy, you wanted to say something about that? Well, no, I wanted to make sure before we finish this that we have time for people to discuss what do they want the Climate Action Hub to do and are people willing to join the core group that's running it? We need about, you know, 10, 12 people to join our core group. There's just five of us at the moment. And is it worth having a three-minute breakout group just to discuss what people think the Climate Action Hub should focus on? Heather? Heather, is, yes. there, is there time for me to just say three very quick suggestions that our group had? Um, <laughs> sure, let's hear them. Okay, one was uh, trying to find a way for the city to discourage people from switching from electrical to natural gas. And um, there's a lot of that happening right now. And also um, su um, was suggested that we figure a way to, to how, how to, how to, bring in more individuals, new individuals, not the usual 80 people that are active all the time in this, but how do we engage the rest of the community? Because um, 80% likely think climate change is real, but don't really know what they can do. And the second one was um, actually um, free, free bus trans free transportation for people, and also converting the Centennial Building at Bevan for a hub for local food distribution, a uh, combination of food share, island routes, permanent, you know, more permanent um, place there, like two or three yeah. times a week, and training training place for, for people who are would-be farmers. So right. thank you. Sorry. Thanks. Um, yeah, I wonder, rather than coordinating breakout rooms again, I wonder if we might just sort of take a moment to all reflect on the, those sort of two questions that Guy brought up that I think are really important for us to get to before we close the meeting. Um, the first question being, are you in? Would you like to be involved in actually setting up this new climate action hub organization? 
uh, you know, do you want to be part of the team that figures out what's the structure, what's the goals, what's the mission, how are we going to run this thing? Um, so if that's you, if you think you do want to be part of that, I would uh, invite you to just put your name in the chat and that will give us a cue that we can uh, reach out to you directly. We've got people's email address from the registration. So if we've got your name, we know you want to do it, we'll reach out to you. Um, so you can put that in the chat. Uh, or send an, an email to us to let us know. Uh, yeah, Guy, go ahead. Yeah, this is separate from the, clim the personal climate leadership initiative that I put out there. So this is about organizing the entire hub for the whole city or the whole region. And Gail Morton saying, what requirements do you have for becoming part of this? The requirements are, you, do you enjoy working in a committee? That you, you, you believe that in the fifth law of sustainability, that it's not, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable that you're willing to put a year's work in sort of meeting with a group of us to sort of really get some substantial results and find ways to engage as many people as possible what else do you want to add to that heather requirements for belonging uh yeah i mean i think that all sounds really good to me um solution focused approach shall we say <laughs> where we're working towards actually where can we go from here yeah um, being, positive, being positive being about partnership being about solution it's not about being whining and moaning and groaning <laughs> yeah yeah and so uh just to, to get to paul's other point there uh sorry to guys other point i've got too many names on my screen um is we'd we'd like to just get a few thoughts on maybe what would be some good first initiatives if we get this climate hub going and we want to really do a push for some specific concrete meaningful changes at the municipal level um feel free to throw your thoughts in there i've, I've heard some good ones kind of coming from all of this discussion in terms of you know local food initiatives uh you know free bus uh passes all these different kinds of ideas that are coming in here so um if folks want to just put in the chat um any thoughts on okay what would be a great starting point of a doable achievable uh specific focused goal uh love to hear them there and of course we're going to uh, capture all of the ideas that were shared in the chat throughout this event and we'll have a read through them afterwards and make sure we kind of compile together all the great thoughts that have been put out there already yeah we got good ideas coming in there yeah Okay, so um, after this event, I hope everybody's feeling really inspired to submit your feedback to the city. Those questionnaires that are open to the public are gonna be closing on November 30th. Um, there are uh, six specific topic questionnaires and there's one general ideas questionnaire. We're gonna send you a link to those in a follow-up email after this meeting sometime in the next couple of days. We'll also send a link to a recording of this event in case anybody missed it. Um, and we'll send a little link as well to a feedback survey because we'd love to hear from all of you about how this event was and suggestions for how we can make them better in the future. Um, so you might wish to think about when you're going to get those surveys done. Uh, might, you know, even if you have five minutes, that would be great. Don't forget to do them. <laughs> Uh, this is really a golden opportunity that we have to let the city know strongly and clearly that we are ready for the big bold changes. Uh, that's going to empower them to actually do the work that needs to get done. So I also want to give a little shout out to our sponsors here. And I'm going to just uh, share one more little slide of who those are. Uh, these are all of the groups that kindly sponsored and helped us promote this event, uh, as well as the artists who, who provided the work of art that we used for the promotions. Um, so thank you to all of these organizations. Okay. And we'd like to close with another piece of poetry. This one is going to be read by Nanaimo's very own Youth Poet Laureate. Her name is Valina Zanetti. So um, Valina, if you would like to unmute yourself and you can take it away. Thank you, Heather, um, for introducing me. I just want to say it was very informative reading people's ideas in the chat and seeing the goals that there is for making an a greener place. I just think that this planet is amazing and super, super special. And it takes care of us, which um, is good. <laughs> you know you want to stay alive. Um, it amazes me that some people don't appreciate it and uh, but meetings with climate activists like the ones here today um, really gives me hope that we can obtain a better, more eco-friendly future. Um, the poem that I will be reading, I wrote for the Reimagine Nanaimo uh, initiative. 
and it is called The Change I Want to See. The Harbor City could be so much more if our emissions are cut off at the core. If the town had more trees up and down and old stores weren't left to create ghost towns. If we could walk along the harbor at night without receiving a creepy invite. And if people learn to not get uptight when a person who is wearing revealing clothing is in sight. If we could stop prejudice against folks from across the seas, and if we can stop judging people by the color of their skin, racism shouldn't be. If we could see homelessness as a broken system's greed, funding could be moved to help these humans shine and succeed. If we could see someone and not assume their gender, we can do it, everyone just needs to work together. If we make these changes in stone, Nanaimo will be beautiful and kind for when my children are grown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valina. That was beautiful. Thanks. What a wonderful way to close our session. And a reminder to me to really just invite uh, everyone um, representing all sectors of society, uh, all, all colors of skin, all levels of ability, uh, all gender orientation, sexual orientation. Uh, we would really like to have this group be representing uh, the real people of Nanaimo and not just the privileged few. So um, please join us and uh, get involved in a leadership role if you can, if you have the energy. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I wish you all a very good evening. I'll stick around for a few minutes in case anybody has a few questions, uh, but this brings the program to a close. And I will look forward to hopefully seeing many of you again. Thank you very much, Heather, for taking on such great leadership for this event. My pleasure. And thank you also to all the folks, uh, Guy and Lori and Laura and Doug, who uh, were so instrumental in setting this up. Thank you.